नमस्ते प्रिय प्रिय योग हार्दिक स्वागत सो नमस्ते डियर योग फ्रेंड्स एंड फैमिली फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड अ वेरी वॉर्म एंड हार्टी वेलकम टू यू फॉर दिस सेशन दैट वी हैव बिफोर यू टुडे श्री औरबिंदो इन हिज बुक द सिंथिस ऑफ योग राइट्स ऑल लाइफ इज योग this book is a magnum opus on for any seeker on the path of yoga all life is yoga is like the theme of indica yoga which is organizing this global festival of uh, global festival of yoga celebrating wellness in this yoga in this festival we have had people from across the globe talking to us on different topics related to different aspects 
of the yogic practice and its application in areas like um, the um, music, dance, in our own lives. Today we have with us a very special panel on a very important topic, which is the workplace. So the topic that we are going to present to you is mindfulness and ha mindfulness, happiness and well-being in the workplace. And we have a very eminent panel of speakers. They are all senior professors and karma yogis in their workplaces from the Reiki Center of Excellence for the Science of Happiness from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. I request all the distinguished panelists to kindly come on screen. This center was a unique initiative by Mr. Satinder S. Reiki, who is the managing director of our systems, its honorary chairman, uh, it, uh, the managing director of our systems and the honorary chairman of this particular center. I would like Mr. Reiki to kindly share with us the inspiration for setting up such a center in a technology institute. Thank you, Anuradha. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this uh, session, the Indica Yoga and the Global Festival of Yoga. Uh, the, the, what I, I looked at was that uh, if you have one happy person, he creates thousand happy people in this networked world that we have. I wanted to get back to my institute, which I love dearly. And uh, I wanted my uh, engineers and uh, graduates who come out of IIT Kharagpur to be happier. So I felt that uh, an institute, because happiness is a choice, which will teach and research happiness would be of great use. So that was the objective and I hope that we, and I think we are producing happier engineers and I hope we'll continue to do so. Thank you very much. I would also like to sh share with you that uh, each of these panelists, I'm very fortunate to belong to this institute. Uh, and also I'm a joint faculty at the center. This institution has its motto, which is Yoga Ha Karma Su Kaushalam. Yoga is skill in works. And that is the main theme of our uh, talk today, which is going to be discussed in great detail by these distinguished panelists. So thank you, Rekiji, for sharing that inspiration for setting up such a center. I would now like to request Professor Priyadarshi Patnak, who will be speaking to us on music, meditation, and happiness. Uh, Professor Patnak is, the is the, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. He's presently the head of the Reiki Center. I invite him to kindly share a few words about the mandate of the center. Namaste, Anuradha. Uh, it is in indeed fortunate to have uh, all these 12 words uh, who made uh, this center uh, possible. Uh, Mr. Satinder Singh Reiki is there. Uh, our eminent advisors, uh, Professor Manas Mandal and Professor Sandhu Chetri are also here. Uh, what we have uh, here is a journey which is roughly three and a half years old. And in these three and a half years, uh, we have been able to establish a center with more than uh, 13 faculty members uh, from various fields like humanities and social sciences, computational sciences, uh, data sciences, uh, uh, signal processing, uh, cognitive sciences, uh, and uh, economics, and a, a wide range of other areas as well, uh, medical sciences, uh, with the intention of uh, converging on something which belongs to everybody and is a specialization, is, doesn't, uh, is not owned by anybody exclusively that is happiness. <laughs> and in this particular context, uh, what we find is that uh, we have a center where uh, we have courses. We have uh, currently four courses running for our uh, students across uh, UG, PG, and PhD. We have uh, a lot of research going on. Interestingly, uh, research which has been initiated by Mr. Reiki on, or is just just been getting initiated on mindfulness with ICMR is also getting initiated on music with a PDF getting initiated and. Uh, uh, something on which Professor Mandal would be exploring further would be on the, uh, the 
the combina the neuro neuroscience of all these aspects these are different areas on which uh, research is getting initiated we have sophisticated labs which have already been set up and work which has been initiated and on this journey one of the fundamental things uh, that drives us uh, something which uh, we must uh, own to professor mandal professor uh, mr uh, leki and uh, to sandu ji is that the fundamental ideology is not uh, only about being happy ourselves which can happen at a later point of time but trying to find out how we can make other people happy especially through technology because we are an uh, engineering institute so this is all i would like to share and we hope the, that uh, we are able to contribute meaningfully to all of you and continue this journey uh, in a meaningful manner thank you thank you very thank much sir patnaik i would now like to uh, introduce you to our distinguished faculty and who is the advisor of our center professor manas k mandal professor mandal is a distinguished visiting faculty at the humanities department and like i said also the uh, advisor of the center so professor mandal a very warm and hearty welcome to you the next person i would like to introduce you to is dr samdu chhetri who is is the former executive director of the gnf center of bhutan and presently a visiting faculty at the center so very warm and hearty welcome to all of you on the panel and it has been i mean i would just like to share with them that to, with the audience that uh, this panel is of made of very distinguished uh, per, scholars and practitioners and yet at the same time they are people who are extremely grounded and they serve as guides and mentors to all of us at the center and at the institute so with these few words i request mr satinder singh reki to make his presentation on spirituality and bismuth or awe to enlighten all of us thank you anuradha uh, i just want to make sure whether you're seeing my sharing of the screen yes we can see it but i would just like to take another minute from your time and just let our audience know about your achievements so far so mr satinder singh reki is the founder and managing director of the board of r systems international limited founded in 1993 He has over 35 years of experience, and he is one of the leading figures in the information technology industry. And he has held senior management positions in HCL Technologies and DISC, which is now known as Synergex, in the United States, Singapore, and India. Mr. Reki has completed his Masters of Business Administration from California State University, Sacramento, and has entered attended several senior management programs from the University of Berkeley and Harvard Business School. a distinguished alumnus of iit kharagpur he has a with a bachelor's degree in technology mr ricky has established the ricky center of excellence as we spoke of and uh, i would now like to invite him to share his uh, presentation on the topic spirituality and bismuth and if you have any questions please put them in the q and a box thank you anuradha i am a c for a seek spirituality and bismad or all go together the journey to spirituality triggers bismad doses of or doses of bismad bismad is a punjabi term which is used in our scriptures and bismad i call is a in emotion and truly a mother of all emotions in which the brain structures change and as our professor mandal says the brain aperture opens up important thing to remember is that it is the journey itself which triggers uh, triggers uh, awe the destination of course is wonderful but uh, the journey itself uh, triggers tiny doses of awe spiritual journey or spirituality is a is a concept uh, which is uh, uh, which has room for many perspectives it's a multifaceted uh, concept and many people have their own ideas about what 
spirituality is about. Mostly people will talk that it's connection, connecting to a higher power. Some people will talk about finding a meaning and purpose in life. Let me just step back. Uh, uh, spirituality is ab about how to make our lives better. How can I live my life better? So trying a, to find a meaning, a deeper meaning, a deeper sense of consciousness, a deeper sense of awareness, and a purpose to life is also one of the uh, things people talk about uh, when they talk about a spirituality and spiritual journey. While we want to find a meaning, I also want to say that there's another thing which happens. And um, uh, when you try and find a meaning, you try and look for goals. And obsession on goals has its own problems because then you, you are in the future. So many times when the people walk on this path, they also realize that life is meaningless. And that brings you to the present moment and a sense of relief and reduces the, the anxiety that we uh, attach to our lives and, uh, and taking life too personally and uh, over seriously. It's about interconnectivity, connecting to each other, connecting to each other in love. We can connect to each other in fear or hatred for someone. That is not spirituality. Love is the ing ingredient for um, interconnectivity here in a spiritual, spiritual journey. And a sense of belonging. Do I have a place in this big world? Many people don't have a sense of belonging to their, to their friends, to the groups that they are in, and uh, uh, to, uh, to their school or to their place of work. Spiritual journey brings about a sense of belonging. And again, that's in love. You feel a part of this world and you have a contribution to make. Then some people talk about waking up, waking up to a new reality something uh, more, more deeper seat of consciousness. Most importantly, it's who am I? That is the search, who I am and who I am not. I will try and focus on that one. I want you to look at our brains. There is a attention switch in our brain. Consider that as a flashlight, a torchlight. It is voluntary or involuntary. Voluntary means like you're paying attention to me. That's voluntary. Involuntary means if there's a big noise or a flash of light or a snake comes in front of you, you're forced to look at it and pay attention to it. So this attention switch is right here in the, in the brain. It focuses on things outside and that outside things come inside you. It can also focus on things inside you, which is your emotions and your thoughts. And whatever it focuses on, it shines its lights on that possesses your mind or your brain. So we are constantly focusing our attention, lighting up things which are in the outside world, and we bring it inside. And then we are focusing on things inside us, the emotions, thoughts, and then that possesses us. The important thing I want to talk about to, with you here in spirituality is, or spiritual journey is that the outside world is changing. Things outside are changing and you can change your attention from one picture to another picture to another picture. And things inside you are also changing. There are different types of thoughts, different types of emotions. You embrace one thought and it creates another one kind of emotion and that goes on. But the only thing that does not change is a core you which is watching everything. That core you I call observer self, which observes everything. And that is also a higher seat of consciousness, a higher seat of awareness, which is awake 24 seven watching everything. But why are we not able to engage with that observer self is because the way we lead our life and there are so many distractions. There's an outside world, there are thoughts, there are emotions, and then we take actions. The outside world is presented to you through a moment. All that you have is a moment. A moment is like a drop in the ocean. 
the ocean is in the drop and drop is in the ocean your outside world is in that moment and moment is in the outside world that comes outside world world unfolds in front of you through a moment everything else is past and what you haven't got is in the imagination when you bring this outside world inside you there are billions of things happening you bring that inside you thoughts are created and multiple thoughts are created and necessarily you'll figure out that i don't create these thoughts they just happen and then emotions are created positive negative whatever and that goes on and which distracts you from the core self the observer self i want you to now focus on the on your brain the brain has no access to the world outside it lives in a dark chamber inside inside your skull and it will probably never have a, an exposure to the outside world but it connects through the outside world through its senses it's a seat of power it does not delegate too much when i look at things outside i see it inside my brain and you don't hear in your ears you hear it in your brain you don't smell in your nose you smell it in your brain and you also feel in your brain so the observer self is watching everything and watching things which are changing inside you and outside you and it just observes for instance if you look at mount fuji mount fuji comes inside the brain and you look at it inside if you are fighting with your spouse again watches if you are stressed out it watches and then more importantly what happens is with all these things happening the heart and the brain are triggered thoughts which are in language and emotions which are sensations are triggered things are continuously changing i want to mention again the observer self just observes that is truly the seat of power the seat of consciousness the seat of awareness and we are we are unable to connect with it and but that's the only thing which does not change and that's really what you are your core you and if you look back at your life as we were growing old we are changing every moment it's like the our hand you get to notice it after a significant period of time when you are 5 years old you had one personality and when you are 15 another and so on as a matter of fact if you the only thing which ties these people uh, ties you at different ages is memory of course but if memory wasn't there it is the core you if you are me if you are to meet yourself in a park uh, at the 5 year old guy and 10 year old girl 15 year old guy you could probably have a meeting because they're all different people so what i'm trying to say is your brains are changing your bodies are changing your personality is changing everything is changing like the our hand and it's difficult to detect but the only thing which is not changing is the core you and now my question is the most important question what happens when you engage with the observer self disengage with your thoughts your emotions your physical self your egoistic self your personality and look behind the curtain what happens that is the spiritual journey trying to discover who this observer self is who is the core me who is the seat of awareness and when you do that then bismad or awe is triggered awe is an overwhelming feeling of being in the presence of something vast and bigger than the self i sometimes think i am the center of the universe it's just me my ego everything when i figure out there is something larger than me bigger than me and i'm a tiny part of this whole cosmos universe the emotion of awe is triggered i feel positively something bigger uh, that i'm a part of a sense of belonging also comes let's talk a little bit more about awe awe is mostly triggered in places of worship 
but it's also been known to be triggered in nature. S stunning sunrises, stunning sunsets have also triggered uh, awe. Pregnant women, when they deliver, and men who are with them have also reported awe. When you're in the presence of a personality you admire, awe is triggered. Sports people have also have or moments, the ball was six feet away and I don't know how I hit that ball. I just swung my racket and it was a ace. And that's why we see the sportsmen bow down at the end of a win or a victory because they realized that something bigger was there with them. So let's talk a little bit more about all uh, the the most important ingredient, ingredient is perceived vastness. I must believe that there is something bigger than me. The stimuli does not have to be very large. Even an ant can do that as long as you say that the creator is really huge to have made such a thing. And it does self transcendent takes place, which means I feel a tiny part of something so large. The attention which I was focusing on myself moves to something bigger than me. And as I mentioned earlier, the experience of the world changes and to absorb and adjust to that experience, a cognitive realignment takes place, which means that the brain structures change. And then most importantly, in the awe experience, the love chemical oxytocin is released. As you probably know, when mothers deliver babies or when they breastfeed, oxytocin is released because oxytocin creates a bond. In awe, the bond is created in love with everybody, with each other. And also a sense of belonging also appears and that sense of belonging is, I have a purpose in this universe. I have a contribution to make. In Vismad, you move from head to heart. Anuradha wanted me to talk about happiness at work. People who have all experiences are happier at work. It's kind of a pause and reset. Sometimes when your uh, computer or your phones don't work, they tell you to switch it off and switch it on. Because when you switch it off and switch on, the old, reset, old settings come back. When you have an odd dose, you, it's a pause and a reset. Old settings plus new settings appear. One of the problems in, uh, in organizations is that employees try to fit in. Fitting in is an effort, but if you feel a sense of belonging, that's a very motivated uh, employee. And belonging is actually a part of some of your acceptance of your own self. So when you have all experiences, you belong and you are a better employee. And remember I said, the brain aperture opens up. It allows for innovative and creative thoughts to come inside. And finally, another thing which happens is time becomes plentiful because you are, you become, uh, the solutions are always around you, but you don't, the brain doesn't let them in because you want a safe solution. And when you're looking for creativity and entrepreneurship and innovation, you have to get, allow the risky thought to come in. People who have all doses of experiences, they allow that. And then they're able to do their work faster and smarter, and they have more time. And they are happier. I've come to the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer any question that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Vekiji, for that uh, awesome presentation. I would like to next invite Dr. Samdu Chetri for his talk on mindfulness, a key to well-being in the workplace. Samduji was the former executive director of GNH Center in Bhutan 
and is presently a visiting professor at the Reiki Center of Excellence for the Science of Happiness. He's, he was born in a cowshed in rural Bhutan. His story is a bit like that of Krishna's and he calls himself a pilgrim of love and compassion. He says that the first step to mindfulness for a pilgrim like him is to know who he is. In light of this, he will give us the insight to realize a deeper meaning of who we are and how we can be mindful in our lives. He is dearly referred to as BBC, uh, dearly referred to by the BBC as a happiness guru. And he was chosen to head up Bhutan's first Ross National Happiness Center based in Thimpu. Uh, Samduji has a very illustrious career in, uh, in the field of economics on which he got his PhD. And then he went on to also be part of the Bhutanese government and lead this movement of happiness there. So we are extremely privileged that he is our visiting faculty at the Reiki Center. And now that he's going to share a few tips, a few thoughts and tips on mindfulness, a key to well-being in the, in the workplace. So Samdhuji, over to you. Thank you, Anuradhaji. It's a, really an honor to be a part of this great movement. Namaskar, greeting of the day to all the loved and compassionate listeners out there. I'm a pilgrim of mindfulness like you. Please forgive me, gurus and fellow listeners, if I make any mistakes. My talk is on mindfulness, and I wish to uncover two major misconceptions many of us hold about mindfulness. Before I begin to explain how we can be or should be mindful in our workspace. First, misconception is that there is no time to practice mindfulness. And the second is mindfulness slows us down and we may have to forgo our goals as we become complacent. Mindfulness is not to sit and meditate. This is just a small part of it, but the most essential part although. Mindfulness is when you connect to yourself and the interdependence. From morning till evening, it is when what you do, think and feel are aligned in positive rhythm of your doings. Mindfulness is when you are present in everything you do, like what Mr. Reiki sir said, that it's moment to moment. Every moment it passes away. So it's moment to moment that we need to be aware of, meaning your heart, head and hands, coordinate in mindful moments. What you do, you become one, such as driving a car, you become a part of the car, not separate from you. You'll feel the pain that you may be inflicting to the car as you hit a pothole or jerk in an uneven road. It means you are in every moment in what you're doing. When you are present in the moment, now and here, moment to moment, as we say, you generate a lot of energy and there's almost 100% free space in our minds, in our brains. In otherwise, a mind full of material and other thoughts to allow greater abundance to come in, what Mr. Ricky said a while ago. We become powerful, vibrant vibrations to align with our purpose of life, in which goal is just a small component. This overcomes the second misconception. We know being mindful in a workplace has a lot of benefits. One, it brings better and higher outcome in lesser time. Two, you remain energized all the time. Three, you will always have clarity in your thoughts and deed. Four, you will remain calm and in peace with yourself. Five, your mind will be open to creativity, like what Mr. Ricky said, you pause and restart. I'll come to that. And six, abundance will begin to flow easily to you. And there are more. You'll be less bothered by others because you learn to forgive, let it go, understand others better, remain in gratitude, and continue to be connected with yourself. The conduct at the workplace will change greatly and give reflection for others to mirror from you when you have become a mindful uh, pilgrim. 
there are major five steps to mindfulness, which are breathing. And the most important, this is the most important, to remind ourselves as we wake up in the morning that we are alive. Make the first deep breath in and slowly let it out from your nose. The second step is concentration through sound, mantras, visualization, gazing, etc. The third step is being aware of the body. Fourth is deep relaxation. And fifth is mindful movements. If you can embed these five steps in your daily discipline, you will be mindful persons, happy as well, always rather. Then how do you do it? As you wake up, sit on the bed, thank the universe for giving you another day to see, to be in service for yourself and for others. Reflect the past day, see what you could have done better if it was reworn to you today. Think of your vision, mission, align them with your activities today, and that's for tomorrow. Begin your minimum six minutes of meditation on the bed. You can do more after you have taken your bath and other things, exercises, but do that first pinch of six minutes minimum meditation on your bed. Put an intention when you are ready to meditate, such as, I'll give you an example, today, I'll bear no ill will towards others, become creative, remain calm and peaceful, listen deeply and speak lovingly, contribute to greater purpose of life, goals in the workplace or off the workplace. Let us do a short mindfulness practice, taking us through this, what I've been speaking. I don't have a bail, so I've improvised myself with some water in a steel glass. Please listen. As you listen, to the bell, sit comfortably with your eyes closed, your back still straight, not stiff, chin slightly tucked in, with no stress on your neck, legs grounded, you're sitting on a chair, tongue lightly touching the upper palate, teeth not biting, shoulders relaxed, and watch your breath. Feel the energy entering from the center of your open palm, resting on your knees or thighs, depending on your sitting posture. Please take a deep breath in. Begin now. Hold it for one or two seconds, three seconds, from, and breathe out from your nose slowly. One more time. One last time. Please feel calm and relax. Take your mind to the feet. Feel the toes. Wriggle them. Feel the sole of your feet, ankles, and lightly twist them. Raise your feet on your toes for the calf muscles and thighs. Fill them, ask them or the entire legs to soften and relax. Thank these wonderful legs of ours for carrying us to the places of need and love since we started to walk on them. Breathe in, feel grounded like the mountain, breathe out, Feel free like the bird. Straighten your lower and upper backs. Lightly move your shoulders and relax them. Breathe in and feel calm in your mind. Breathe out and feel composed in your posture. Feel the hands on your lap and ask them to soften and relax. And thank them for enabling you to carry, touch, feel, give, receive, embrace, write, and so on. Breathe in and put a smile on your face. And breathe out and be happy.
Move your awareness to your neck. Slightly move it. Find the right position for it and relax the neck. Breathe in. Feel pure like the morning dew. Breathe out and feel fresh like the lotus flower. Take your thoughts to your jaws, move them slightly, and ask them to soften and relax. Now move the awareness to the head and pause. Reflect and realize if the mind is assessing, judging, evaluating, or distracted. Recognize whatever it is doing and ask the mind to be still, clear, calm, and peaceful. Breathe in and feel at ease. Breathe out and feel in peace. Now shift your awareness from your mind to your heart and see what the heart is doing. Is it agitated, lonely, sad, angry, jealous? Whatever is the negative feeling that is holding now, recognize it and just let it go and relax. Arise love and compassion that has no boundary expectations, but is pure, humble, and simple. Breathe in and feel loved. Breathe out and feel compassionate. Continue breathing in and out for a minute, feeling calm and blissful and realize you are now the light for others and yourself. Breathe in, feel calm, breathe out, feel blissful, and imagine yourself as the light for your Disciplining as mindfulness. So if we learn to discipline ourselves, we will always arise to live moment to moment, keeping our minds completely clear and open to many good things that will come into us. When you have sat for two hours in a row in your office working table, like Mr. Ricky said, restart yourself. So what does that mean? You get up, take a few moments, of mindfulness. Sit back and scan your body like we just did. Your body, your mind, and your heart. Try to scan them. <clears throat> All this may take about your 10 minutes of your time, but mind you, those 10 minutes are so powerful that you'll be rejuvenated back for another many hours to work. But make as a discipline to wake up, to get out of your chair every 10 minutes, uh, sorry, every two hours and do at least 10 minutes of goodness to your own self. And you'll realize that you're again, full of vigor and zeal to work for many more hours together. But mind you, wake, get up out of your chair every two hours, take that break, 
take that pause and restart yourself. Anytime when you hear a chime of a bell, anywhere for that matter, just hold for a brief moment and take a few deep breaths, breaths in and out and feel that you're alive. How many times in, from morning till evening do we realize that we are breathing? We hardly do that. But take a deep breath in any time you hear a bell, chime of a temple or a monastery or a church, and anything, a cry of a baby, anything that you often get the sounds from, tripping of a bird, all that moment to take deep breath in and say, I'm alive. And that's the magic of life, nothing more. Now, mind you, remind ourselves all the time that very soon in one day, we don't know when that would be, we will pass away. So what is that thing that I can leave behind today if I don't wake up tomorrow? Should be the journey of us every day in our lives. You know, when you start doing that, what happens is the grace of the universe will give you abundance. And every time you breathe in, say, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. Make that affirmations in your mind. Give you an example, such as, I'll enjoy the abundance in that movement, you know, when you are remembering to breathe in, take these affirmations, prepare your own self affirmations or some kinds of mantras, such as, I will enjoy the abundance in connection with the vibration of the universe. You know, something like this. Have those affirmations repeated in your mind and what we learned from the neuroscientists like Professor Manas Mandel and we heard from Mr. Ricky Singh that our aperture of the mind opens and we create a new neuropath, a neuropathway for our new ways in life, in our new ways of belief and in our deductions in who we are, what we are and how we can take this journey forward to be a greater good human being. Thank you and much blessing of the universe to you all. I hope this was a session from my heart. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sambhuji, for giving us very valuable tips on how to become karma yogis in our workplace using certain mindfulness techniques. So thank you very much for that beautiful sharing, which will be very helpful for our participants. I would now like to invite Professor Priyadashi Patnaik, who is the head of the Reiki Center of Happiness and also a professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. Professor Patnaik is going to speak to us about music, meditation, and happiness, and lead us through an understanding of how these can help us to improve our experience at the workplace. So thank you very much, Professor Patnaik. Over to you. Thank you, Anuradha. The way I would like to begin the session is uh, by trying to link the earlier presentations uh, together with what I have to say. Given that uh, the first two presentations were so beautifully done, I believe that my job would be to link music to them uh, rather than uh, talking about music and happiness and music meditation, reflection and happiness in its own uh, distinctive uh, way. So although I have a presentation with me, uh, which I'll be displaying, I'll be only focusing on specific aspects of it, which are highlighted and not uh, go into the details of it. Now, to begin with, uh, I would say that uh, today in the morning, when uh, I had a little time uh, before this session began, I was going through Eckhart Tolle's uh, book, and uh, the focus I found was very Buddhistic uh, in certain ways, uh, where the focus is on the concept of now. Another interesting thing that uh, he keeps on talking about is the concept of somebody who is observing very much like Mr. Reiki is the observing self. So what I realized and what I realize every moment is that uh, whenever, whenever uh, we are, um, wherever we are and wherever uh, we do anything, it is in the present that we are located, not in the past or in the future and yet the majority of our time is focused on the past, uh, reflecting, regretting about things which have happened in the past, or anticipating, fearing, or sometimes uh, anticipating with pleasure what is going to happen in the future. 
and as has been uh, reiterated uh, by Sanduji, it is only when we manage to bring our mind to the here and to the now that the sense of uh, being uh, at ease with oneself, with total harmony with ourselves, begins to emerge, and uh, a lot of things that trouble us gradually fade away and disappear. If you're looking at the various uh, meditative traditions across the world, we also find a similar thing uh, emerging, echoing, which says that uh, probably these experiences, these knowledges, these wisdoms are universal and uh, something which transcends all these cultures. It is within this context that I would like to bring in aesthetic experience uh, and especially the experience of music, which in the Indian tradition has often been linked very deeply with the spiritual tradition. So I would like to share my screen now and uh, give you some uh, basic uh, glimpses into what I'm talking about right now. But more important than that is to say that uh, the points that I'm going to make relate to music, meditation, and happiness. And the workplace is something which is there in the background. It is true that uh, Many experiments have been done where uh, music has been introduced to workplace uh, to see its impact and it has been found that it has effectively helped improve uh, the mindset of the people, their mental, con mental conditioning, sometimes their efficiency, but again there is a lot of complexity involved because different kinds of work and different kinds of music have relationships of their own. However, my current focus is on the ancient tradition, uh, which focuses on music as spiritual experience and the contemporary uh, research, which I've just touched upon and where there is nobody more competent than Professor Mandel to take it forward, which also reiterate these experiences. So when we come to our tradition, uh, we have found that uh, in the tradition by the time of Nati Sastra, music has been equated with Gandharva Veda uh, and uh, linked to Sam Veda. Uh, and this uh, higher, the status, this elevation in status, status suggests that it is something which is recognized as a holy scripture, as a holy uh, knowledge system, which has the uh, possibility or the potential of taking us in the direction of moksha. Now, when we look at the first reference to meditation, uh, music in the spiritual tradition, we have the concept of uh, chanting the Om uh, in the Chandra Gyopanishad. And through this evocation of this sound, this harmonious sound, which is anahata, which is not uh, obstructed by the, the, the palette and the, the vocal structures, uh, one can achieve uh, spiritual bliss. And the other one is the spiritual tradition, uh, the aesthetic tradition of exploring how music leads to uh, a sense of uh, uh, loss of identity, which is Avinavagupta's theory of, in the context of aesthetics, including music, visual arts, dramatics, and everything else. The other point I would like to make is that if you're looking at the historical tradition, we find that the Bhakti tradition, which was so powerful starting from the 13th century to and going up to even the 18th and the 19th century uh, is a tradition uh, where music, the combination of uh, sounds, meaningful sounds and of notes has been something which uh, has driven uh, this tradition forward. And uh, you have Vajans, Kirtans, uh, again, a significant component of this uh, Sikh tradition as well where you see that through the combination of meaningful sounds and notes, one has the potential of transcending and going beyond one's small self, one small transient, perpetually eternally changing self. So coming to the point uh, of experience of mu music or ananda bliss, I would just like to say that uh, Avinav Gupta, one 10th century aesthetician talks about the experience of emotions. And we know that music is a very powerful tool for generating different kinds of emotions. And says that this is something which is in the realm of aesthetics. It is not in the realm of practicality. It is not in the realm of 
everyday life. And once we experience uh, this particular kind of uh, music in the context of drama or independently in itself, we are in a state where we forget ourselves, we lose ourselves, we lose our sense of identity. And when we say lose our sense of identity, we are in the moment, we are in the night, uh, we are in the now, and the concept of time with its the element of the past and the future kind of disappear. And it is within this particular context that there is the potential, there is the promise of Ananda, or uh, Brahmananda, a bliss uh, that can be achieved through music. Now, when we are looking at uh, the contemporary context, we suddenly realize that uh, these ancient traditions are now being reiterated through many modern uh, experiments and research. And I'm just going to focus on one thread of it, as I told you, because time is short and I want to link it to what we are talking about, the earlier eminent speakers have already said, which is music makes one more mindful. So there is a very strong connectivity between mindfulness and music. Researchers have suggested that music and meditation share common benefits. We will not go into that right now. But what is very relevant for us is that mindfulness practices, meditative practices, to a very great extent can be uh, enhanced, improved, and can benefit from the presence of music. In fact, uh, in some of the traditions uh, where uh, somebody does meditation, one, uh, I've talked to some of the experts and they're told that maybe contemplative music just before meditation would calm the mind enough so that one can then focus and either do mindfulness meditation or concentration meditation or the different traditions of meditation. So this is another very interesting thing. And we find that uh, music enhances mindfulness. Mindfulness enhances the quality of uh, musicality in people. And if you're looking at the workplace context, the way that uh, mindfulness is very, very meaningful, certain kinds of music can have a therapeutic effect, effect on the mind because they drive us to attend to the moment, to the current moment, to the now. So a stepping step, a stone to mindfulness could be in that sense music. When we are coming to another interesting aspect uh, that music has, that is the ability for emotion contagion. Uh, in two senses. One in the sense that uh, when you listen to a particular kind of music, particular kinds of emotions are evoked. But more important that, that when you are affiliated to a particular tradition of music, it has been found by some researchers that that in itself impacts your positive feeling towards the people who belong to that tradition. So that this contagion is uh, something which spreads beyond. And uh, this in itself is very significant because the ability to uh, practice uh, uh, meditate uh, mindfulness practices or Buddhist traditional practices where you have Maitri Bhav or loving kindness is something also which is emulated through music of specific kinds. You see that I will not go into the details uh, since this PPT is being said, you can see that different parts of the brain are associated with different kinds of musical functioning. But there are two locations specifically, and Professor Mandel again can enlighten us, uh, we are novices here, that uh, where you see that uh, music manages to generate, trigger our pleasure sense, and uh, acts very, as a very powerful uh, medium to drive us to repeat a particular ag activity, to form a habit. Some of us have talked about uh, disciplining, and one of the key components of discipline happens to be positive habit formation. And listening to a particular kind of music at a specific point of time could be a habit. And uh, this habit could have real positive impact in terms of generating uh, positive hormones to make us feel good. There are other areas uh, where uh, music helps us control emotions. And again, uh, I will not go into the details, but to sum up my short presentation, I would like to simply say that whether we're talking about mindfulness or we are talking about specific kinds and traditions of music, what they help us do is focus on the here and now. And when we are very deep listeners, they help us transcend our little selves so that the observer self manages to experience uh, 
with a certain degree of detachment uh, the entire thing and we come out of that experience feeling much more calm and tranquil uh, music thus can be a means for for the meditative practices and if you're looking at some of the living traditions whether they are the bhajan thought tradition the kirtan tradition there is a spread effect there is a contagious effect so very often whether we are talking about a community space or whether we are talking about workspace specific kinds of music practice there and specific periods of times allocated to music or listening of music can have beneficial impact we know that uh, music helps in sleep in relaxation and in the workplace ambience uh, sorry for the typo it also uh, is something which brings us to the here and to the now to the current moment but what i'm just trying to share with you as somebody who has been associated with music for the last 15 to 20 years is that music has the potential especially if you're looking at our tradition as well as contemporary scientific research of taking us beyond these to a more profound experience of the self thank you very much thank you very much uh, professor patnaik for that uh, very insightful understanding of the role of music in our well being and i would just like to inform our audience that professor patnaik has authored and edited more than 14 volumes of text reference and creative works he has a number of research papers translations poems short stories illustrations and photographs in many national and international journals because of his very varied and important background he is also the secretary at the nehru museum of science and technology at iit kharagpur and the rector's nominee at the technology students dimkhana at iit kharagpur and as you can see the subject of his interest has been the relationship of well being visual communication music and emotion communication and culture media communication translation and digital humanities so if you have any further information you would like to understand any of this in depth please reach out to professor patnaik and we will give you the details of uh, the contact details of all these uh, eminent panelists at the end of the session our next and final panelist for this program is professor manas k mandal dr mandal is a distinguished visiting professor at the indian institute of technology kharagpur he is also an adjunct professor at the national institute of advanced studies iisc bangalore he was formerly a distinguished scientist and director general of the life of life sciences in drdo india he holds a phd in psychology from calcutta university he has completed his post doctoral research as a fulbright fellow in the us and an nserc fellow in canada as a visiting faculty dr mandel completed his tenure at harvard university usa kyushu university japan and aachen university germany dr mandel specializes in the areas of neuropsychology and cognitive sciences he has to his credit 14 books over 100 research papers in international and national journals of high repute these researches are cited in more than 300 international journals and books with over 5000 citations we are extremely privileged that professor mandel is the advisor at the reiki center of happiness and he is going to try to summarize and to add his own insights on this topic through the subject neurotheology neuroscience of meditating brain so professor mandel over to you thank you good morning to everybody we have listened to all of us and uh, three great speakers and the idea is that uh, what is the take home message the take home message is that we have heard about mind mindset and mindfulness the question is how do we relate as i find in the question box that how do we relate mind with mindfulness i think the barrier comes is the mindset that is the belief system that we have and the filter that intersects between what we see in the outer world and what we see in the inner world but mind doesn't work actually in vacuum it works somewhere 
If my brain is dead, mind is dead. Therefore, we need to also understand what happens to our mind. When we are trying to be mindful, and the locus definitely is the brain. Since the time is short, we would not like to give you more answers. Rather, we would like to raise some questions for you so that it reverberates in your mind and get back with more queries everywhere because we are not the only source for you. Well, the question is, the first question that comes, well, brain is, is a big subject. We cannot tell everything about it, but neurotheology is a subject matter which deals with it. Anybody who is interested can actually go for that. Question is, what these practices help us? What Rekhiji said about spiritualism, what Samdhuji said about mindfulness, what Dr. Patnaik talked about, sound and meditation. All these are actually trying to make the brain more reflective rather than reactive. So reactive, more often we are trying to reflexive and reactive in our workplace. But if we try to become reflective, we would be able to reduce the noise level in the brain. And if we can re reduce this noise level through certain exercises, there is nothing better than that. But the questions that I would, I would like to put forward before you, are we, or do we have only the noisy brain? Are we unwell always? Do you think that having negative emotions is always harmful? If I'm very happy and if there is a tiger in front of me, will I be able to survive? Do I always need to be happy? Is it not good to have one bad day in a week? Will it not help us to adapt in this environment? What happens when we are not at all stressed? Is the brain very peaceful during resting state? For your information, let me tell you, when the brain is at resting state, it uses maximum glucose. So it uses more energy. Then what, we, what is that we do with mindfulness and spiritual exercises? It actually reorganizes, reallocates the glucose level or the energy within the brain so that you can focus better. So there are many methods in meditation. Some methods say, that you can attain better through certain exercise, which is mindfulness. In some meditation, we submit ourselves. We don't want to attain anything else. We submit ourselves to the Almighty. In some exercises, we, we try to be guided by someone else. Some of the meditation are unguided. In some meditation, we try to be motionless. Some meditation are through certain movement like yogic practices. Some meditation are silent. Some meditation are more vocal. The question is, through different maneuvers, we try to attain something. What is that something? That something is about our capability to reflect. So what all these speakers have told us, that the ultimate goal of all these exercises is to be reflective rather than always try to be reactive. To become reactive has become conditioned in modern life because we are always trying to reach out to the reality. But the reality within is also very important. It's very easy because we are very reactive to understand others. It's very difficult to understand ourselves. And to understand others after you understand yourself, probably extremely difficult, only spiritual people and the people at a very high order can only do that. So the question is, the tradition that we have spoken about just now through different procedure to attain that particular level doesn't answer one question for me. That is how do we reach our unconscious? Because the universe of mind is lying in the unconscious. And we have got racial unconsciousness. That is the whole race and its unconscious DNA is also with us. How do I access that? Will yogic practice be able, will help me
to attain that level of unconsciousness. Because by these practices, we bring the mind to such a state so that we understand what are our primitive desires, what are our wishes that we could not fulfill, what are those things that we could not attain and we still want to. These questions also needed to be answered. So I would hope the institution through which we are studying would also like to understand through these practices, will I ever be able to understand what is there in my unconscious or will try to only mask our worries, anxieties, stresses through certain practices. My personal belief is that if we try to understand that insightful learning of mindfulness or spirituality, we need to come out and open the mental aperture. We have a problem in our real life. If there is a door closed, we keep on seeing the door closed. We never see that so many other doors are also open. So mindfulness and spirituality only allows us to see very many options. And through these options, we will be able to go back. So for me, dream is also a form of mindfulness exercise. If I can dream perfectly, that's a mindful exercise. So the question is whether we are very mindful during unconscious state, very mindful during deep sleep, very mindful during resting state, are all answered in scientific inquiries. I would surely like you to assist us to answer these questions because in Pennsylvania, Robert and the Davidson group actually have studied more than 62,000 hours of meditative state and they found something very radical, very different. I would like to stop at this point of time, leave the questions with you and make sure that you continue to think about it and enrich us with your thought process. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Mandal, for uh, helping us understand a little more in detail what really happens when we are doing these practices on our brain. Thank you for that. Uh, may I now request uh, the panelists to please come on screen and I, I will ask you certain questions that have been uh, posed by our audience. Uh, they have been a very engaging and a very keen audience and there are a lot of positive uh, feedback about the value of what you have shared. A uh, lot of appreciation coming in for that. So the first question that I have is uh, for uh, Mr. Reiki. So it's by somebody called Philippe Montaño Socares. So I believe it's from the uh, far, you know, from the Americas, the South Americas probably. And he's saying that Namaste, thank you for this talk. My question is used, what methodology can be used for triggering bismuth in the workplace? Uh, thank you, Anuradha, and thank you for your question. Um, I can only tell you how to try and trigger uh, bismuth or awe outside the workplace, and then you can apply the results in the workplace. There are two things which we live in an awe deprived world today. You know, the world unfolds to us through uh, cell phones and laptops. We have, we have forgotten to sit under trees. So two areas which I feel help in triggering awe, one is nature, an awe walk, where you walk and think and believe that you're very fortunate to be on this earth, where there are trees, where there's water, where there is plants, flowers. Mars doesn't have all of that. This is the kingdom of the creator created specially for you. And the other one is, of course, uh, this, the one where places of worship uh, have helped in triggering awe. That experiences then you take to workplace and uh, I think you'll be able to spread awe over there. Thank you very much, Riki Ji, for sharing some insight on that. I would next, I have a question for uh, Dr. Samdu Chetri. And uh, Samduji, there is somebody asking you, uh, what is the difference between mindfulness and meditation? And how can we do both? Uh, how can either or both become compulsory in homes for both the recovery or the aged orphanages? So, you know, in different kinds of work atmospheres. And um, 
whether this can, benefit can be inculcated into the patients of different ailments. So how can the practitioner in their workplace do it and how can it benefit the people who are they're engaging with? Um, thank you, Anuji. Thank you for the guy who has asked this question. Wonderful question. Thank you. You see mindfulness and meditation. Mindfulness is a broader thing. Meditation is just a small component of mindfulness, but a very essential component. In different age groups, like if you're talking about a child who is just two years old, three years old, you want to bring mindfulness to that child, the child will not understand. What you need to do is probably ask the child to sleep on, on his or her back and put a, you know, some kind of a, a thing, a stuffed thing on her belly or his belly and ask them to breathe in and breathe out and look at that, how it rises and falls. Maybe you can apply that same thing to people who have lost their minds, elderly people, but definitely with some amount of quiet meditation, sitting and just listening to your breathing, being just flowing with your breath in and out is going to be marvelous way of mindfulness because it's going to bring you to a next level of clearing your mind altogether. You know, with all that you have, with the pain that you suffer, when you're mindful, you're connecting your mind with your body and the pain. And when you're connecting, you're aware of it. When you're aware of it, you tend to let go of it and you suffer less. I don't know if I've answered this question. If not, I would ask Professor Manas Mandal to help me. I think you have answered. Uh, we'll go on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Samduji. I would like to next ask my, I mean, like to ask the next question uh, to Professor Patnaik. It's related to music. There are many questions in each of these categories for each of you because you've evoked so many more questions in their minds, which is a very positive sign of this, the success of this particular panel. But uh, Professor Patnaik, there's this question to you on music and a very interesting question by Sunilji who says, does only spiritual and classical music evoke the states you spoke of? Or does even popular music have this ability? Uh, well, the way I would like to respond is that uh, the categories of spiritual, the categories of secular are constructed by us. If you're looking at uh, music uh, within its own context, we find that music has certain distinctive features. And if you're looking at features, and from a psychological perspective, you would have uh, one, two key features which are very, very significant. One is arousal and the other one is violence. Arousal is determined by the rhythm component of music. So if you have fast tempo, then the arousal is high. If you have slow tempo or no rhythm at all, uh, that is no uh, uh, audible rhythm at all. The, as in uh, Allah, let us say, then it is slow tempo. It can regulate and calm you down. When it comes to Professor Patnak, sorry, we lost you. You're muted. So I was disconnected. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so when we're talking about, uh, I will just reiterate very quickly the two points that I was making. When we're talking about arousal, the tempo plays a very significant role. And when we're talking about violence, the note configuration and the, the, the series of notes and the way they are linked play a very significant uh, role. For instance, whether they are major notes or minor notes and the way they are configured would determine the kind of emotion that it would evoke. So the response to your question is that, ignore, let us ignore these genres of uh, spiritual music or popular music. If we focus on these two aspects, we know how music is going to influence us. So probably that is the response to your question. If we want to be excited, we want to be thrilled, we are looking at uh, positive emotions and uh, let's say uh, fast rhythm. When we are looking at uh, calming ourselves down, we are looking at again, uh, Emotions of particular kind being evoked may be serious, may be tranquil, and slow tempo. So I would respond in this particular manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patnak, for giving us this clarity on the fact, especially that the labeling that we do of music is a, is a human labeling, and it is not necessarily an intrinsic property of the music itself. And what is important there for us to take for our own practice. 
I have another question for uh, Professor Manas Mandal. So, sir, in these times when uh, you know life is so stressful, and uh, we tend to take recourse to easy methods of uh, relieving ourselves of the stress, especially at workplace. Uh, there is a question from uh, Harsha ji who says that uh, drugs like uh, psilocybin allows new connection among different parts of the brain, thereby introducing us to new ways of thinking. And he's saying any opinions about this? Like I'm elaborating on the question a little more and wanting to ask that why should we not resort to uh, easy solutions like drugs and all? Why should we do practices like meditation and mindfulness? What is the effect on the brain? So if you could kindly shed some light on that. I'll quickly answer for that for the benefit of time. The question is that uh, whenever we do meditation, the brain releases endorphin, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. All these biochemicals are released because of yogic practices and meditational practices. But as long these chemicals are released by your own body, you will not require any support from your external agency. But the moment you take psilocybin or, or lysergic acid diethylamide, or uh, raw fi alkaloid, these are all psychotomimetic drugs. When you take it from outside, the brain will stop producing insight. When the brain pr stops producing insight, you are compelled to take that drug, which is called addiction. So psilocybin is basically a psychotomimetic drug or psychotogenic drug. I would never ask anybody to take anything of that sort in order to boost their level, even for enhancing their sleep or arousal level. That's forbidden from the good mental health point of view. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manas Mandal. I think that was a piece of advice that everybody can benefit from, uh, be it in the educational workspace, in a sense, or be it in a, a more professional career workspace, where one is really looking for a quick solution and the dangers of looking for quick solutions. Yes. So thank you for that. I think this entire session has been very beautifully um, summarized and uh, the appreciation shared for that by Brigadier K. Virinder Singh, who's a very regular participant on all our sessions. So he says that today was a capsule uh, or capsules of wisdom given by all learned speakers, pearls of wisdom for us to probe further. Thanks to all the esteemed panelists. Uh, like I said, that summarizes the feeling of gratitude that our audience has had for the valuable sharings that you have uh, given for, to all of us on this particular session, a session that deserved probably a whole day's workshop. And uh, I will uh, invite everybody to look at the Ricky Center website and to see how you can collaborate with this center at the IIT Kharagpur and also to share your experiences with us in any of these domains that have been discussed today. So with these few words, I think what we will do in the interest of time and the fact that the questions are pouring on, uh, <laughs> but we cannot take them all. So what I would suggest we do is I will inform the audience of the remaining programs for the day. And I will return to you with uh, requesting you for information on how people can connect to each one of you and get more answers to the questions that have come up. So I'd request Shinivasji to please put up the poster for the rest of the day's programs. Uh, Anuradha, I just want to say one thing. I mm -hmm. want to thank Anuradha for, and the Indica for setting this up and organizing it so well. So well. Thank you, Anuradha. Thank you very much for those words of encouragement. And uh, thanks from all of us as well, Anuradha. Thank yes, you. I'll, I will come back to you. I will also come back. I'll make this announcement and I'll come back to you for listening to your parting words for the audience as well. So uh, we have with us in the afternoon session, uh, Bina Mirchandani ji, who is the chief faculty of Ritambara Wellness, which is also a partnering, partnering organization with this, uh, for this global festival of yoga. Uh, Bina ji is going to be talking to us on Wellness 9. And in the evening, we have a very, very special session by Rangan Ramakrishnan ji. Uh, Rangan ji is the founder of Shrutiram Gurukulam in Bangalore. He hails from a very illustrious uh, family of speakers who do these pravachanas on the Ramayana. And there's going to be more introduction of him in the evening when he speaks, but this is a session that is really not to be missed. He's going to be talking to us on the yoga of the Ramayana. 
So please make yourselves available, not just for these sessions, but for all the sessions that this uh, festival is trying to bring your way. And I uh, would just like to mention to those of you who have missed out on the sessions, because I saw some comments on saying, how can we find this material again? So we've had these excellent presenters talking on very important topics, which are all recorded for us on indicayoga.com. They can also be found on Indica Yoga Facebook page as well as on the Indica Yoga YouTube channel. So the recordings are uploaded almost soon after. So all of that material is there, a very valuable documentation on how yoga can be applied in various fields on life. And today's topic was on applying these spiritual techniques for happiness and well-being at the workplace. Because in the different streams of yoga, uh, karma yoga is a very important one. And Swami Vivekananda was in every sense a karma yogi and encouraged people not to go away to mountains and do your yoga there, but to be in the midst of life, in the midst of activity, action. And in that context, be able to experience awe be able to practice mindfulness, be able to re take recourse to uh, techniques such as music and meditation and to understand how all of that enlighten our brain and make us better people in our wake workspaces. So with these words, I just request each of the panelists to let our audience know how they can reach out to you and have their questions answered and learn much more from your wisdom and experience. So, Mr. Reiki, if I can request you to start, please. Uh, you see, I'll just say one thing. I'd like people to go for a awe walk and uh, go with new eyes as if you're walking on the kingdom of the creator and leave your cell phones behind. <laughs> and how can they reach out to you? So if people have questions, how can they know a little more about what you do and how, they can, how can they connect to you? I, you can provide them my email address. That should be fine. Could you just, if you don't mind telling us, we'll write it, type it out just now on the on the thing here. Rick, Ricky, R E K H I. Yes. At. At. R Systems, letter R, R Systems, one word. Yes. Dot com. Dot com. Thank you very much. So I request all of you to please connect to Ricky G and learn much more because he's one of the leading. Uh, pe persons in his field and there's a lot to learn from the joyful atmosphere he creates whenever he is here at the center and wherever he goes across the world there's a lot to learn from his uh, joyful personality and encouraging guidance thank you reiki ji very much for being here and sharing these words with us the next person i would like to invite to uh, share his contact details and uh, ways in which people can connect to him is samduji Thank you, Anuradha ji. Thank you, Indika Yoga, for bringing us together here. Well, my one thing that I would like to share is try just close your eyes and take a deep breath in and out. That is enough for us to live in the present moment. And that is enough to calm us down. That's enough to switch on and off. Just breathing in and out. Just that much, nothing more. Breath is with us all the time, but you need to remind, halt it. And to remind yourself, as I said, if you hear the cry of a baby or some trips of a bird or some chime of bell, any sound you hear, just give that moment to breathe in and out and say, I'm alive. And definitely you can reach me at samdu.chetri at iitkzp.ac.in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Samduji, for those, uh, that very important tip that we can easily take recourse to for our wellness. Thank you. I would now like to invite uh, Professor Patnaik to kindly share how people can contact you. They can reach out also to the center, Reiki Center, if you have a message. I would like you to also share your personal message and also uh, maybe a message from the Reiki Center that you are heading presently. Thank you, Anuradha. Uh, from the perspective of music, all I would like to say is that many of us uh, multitask and listen to music, which is perfectly fine. But uh, maybe uh, I hope that this small uh, interaction makes you aware of the fact that uh, music can play a very significant role in bringing us, bringing our minds back to now. And hence, uh, based on your 
orientation, the time of the day when you would like to uh, have leisurely activities and your choice of music, it's very important that you spend a little time involving yourself uh, in the uh, very detailed, intense experience of music and that, that can help a lot. From the perspective of the center, we are extremely happy to interact with the eminent uh, uh, people audience over here in any way possible. Uh, I'll be sharing my email ID uh, after this, uh, and I'll also be sharing the web page of uh, the uh, center so that they can know of our activities and they can connect with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patnaik, for that uh, for the, that invitation again to use music as a helpful means to feel wellness at in a stressful situation of the workplace, etc. So I'd like to now uh, request Professor Mandel to kindly share his uh, piece of advice with the audience and also to allow people to know how they can reach out to you for any of their questions. Thank you for an excellent session, Narada. I think uh, my, my suggestion is if we can go a little unorthodox, that is create uh, meditation while in sleep. So sleeping meditation and while we dream because that's the drain through which we purge out all of our stress, difficulties, arousals. And uh, if we can develop some more insight about our unconsciousness through meditational process, because all we have been talking about in our conscious level only, which is just one third of our whole mind. So being a psychologist, I am more interested in the area of unconsciousness. And if anybody is interested to explore that part, and what kind of dream and dream meditation is possible. I'm ready to get some lessons from any one of you. And if you want to reach me, well, I work more in the area of brain, but brain is something which is everybody working. So you will get a lot of answers in Google, but some questions that I raised that what is possible through our traditions, our Indic traditions, understanding the whole idea of when we become unconscious, like in sleep, what kind of meditational process can actually be executed. So my email is mandalmanaske at yahoo.com. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mandal, for sharing your uh, important wisdom with the participants and also for giving us your contact details. Um, I would now like to just uh, invite the audience to understand, uh, to know, I mean, I would like to share with you that uh, we've been talking of music, we've been talking of all these different techniques by which we can experience wellness in our own workplaces, especially. But the fruit, uh, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. And unless you are actually implementing any of this, you would never really know how effective it is in uh, your own life experience. And that is what yoga is all about. It is not just about talking about yoga, but it is also being able to exercise it, to actually do it. And knowing these benefits from your first hand experience, because everything that has been talked about in the yoga world is experienceable and knowable by every individual. These are not the prerogatives of just some uh, people who have reached heights. They are people, ordinary people like us, who have used these various techniques and achieved the glories that they have in their inner realm. So please uh, do practice these tips. I mean, I think the session was a very, very valuable one. The center is a very important uh, aspect, is a very important center in the Indian Institute of Technology that is meant to create happy engineers, as Reiki Ji said. Happy engineers then will go on to their workplaces and make happier work environments. I would also like to put on record that this uh, center was instituted with the vision also of our former director, Pro Professor Parthapatim Chakraborty. Together with Reiki Sir, they conceived of this and allowed many of us to benefit from it. And we've been talking of music, I'd like to invite our participants to please join us on 
Saturday, we have a day with a lot of music coming your way. In the afternoon, we have a session by Aurelio from Oroville, who will be talking about uh, different musical instruments and how we can tune ourselves to these different ex instruments and experience healing through them. In the evening, we have a very well-known and renowned Kirtan uh, singer. He is Krishna Das, who has been the great follower of Neem Karoli ba Baba and a big bhakta of Hanumanji. So Rekhiji started the session by talking also of the role of Kirtans and how that inspires awe. I invite, and then Priyoda again, uh, Professor Patnaik spoke of how music can make us feel better. So I invite all of you to stay with these sessions and make the most of this joyful experience that we are trying to bring your way through the celebration of wellness. So thank you very much. Please stay tuned. Listen to this thank you. particular. Thank video. you very much. Again, thank you very much for being on the session with us. Thank you.